Good morning. Uh, so we let me summarize where we stopped. Uh, we uh, discussed uh, mostly last time we discussed the properties of the uh, free energy, or which is the same, the effective action. Uh, and basically, the discussion was very simple. Uh, we just said. Uh, if you want to describe a critical phenomena uh, in a system with certain symmetry, um, then you have to, first of all, you have to choose the order parameter. Uh, and this, this was our choice uh, for the Ising magnet. We, we chose uh, a scalar field. Um, and uh, then you write down the most general uh, expression in terms of the scalar field, which contains minimal number of derivatives and uh, minimal number of nonlinear terms. Uh, so you, you are doing this, uh, realizing, of course, that you dropped quite a number of terms and uh, you have to estimate them later, that uh, checking that you didn't make uh, big mistakes by dropping them. Uh, okay. Uh, in this, uh, and then we said that uh, only for there is a critical dimension in general. Most often, the critical dimension is four, and if. Um, in, in the spaces of higher dimensions, we said uh, there's, uh, you can use semi-classical approximation. So to describe the distribution of the order parameter, you simply, in various situations, you simply solve, uh, minimize the function of free energy. Uh, and that's, by the way, how a great success with superconductivity was achieved um, in the ginzburg lander equations. Uh, the free energy predicted the existence of vortices and other interesting classical structures, which we will discuss later in this course. Mm. <coughs> and then you say, uh, however, if the dimension is um, not very large, the, field are, the fields are likely to interact, uh, and uh, this is basically the problem, how to account for this interaction, what it leads to. And we said that it is seen in a very simple way. For example, we write down the Dyson equation for uh, the green function. By the way, it's clear that this is not the, the, the mu is nothing but the square of the mass here, of the physical mass. Mm. I will return to this point in a second. Um, so, uh, minus self energy corrections, uh, like this, plus this, plus, etc. And we saw that these self-energy corrections are actually, if mu is small enough and dimension is less than critical, they become larger, much larger than the zero approximation. And in this situation, of course, uh, classical theory doesn't make sense. These quantum fluctuations, this interaction is 100% um, relevant. And, uh, as uh, we will see today, uh, we can actually guess uh, what uh, that we can. It's natural to guess that in some way, when you use the exact green function, it is much greater than the bare green function. So we will the right approximation, the mean field approximation, is to neglect this and leave this. But the, it intuitively seems that we need to do something quite the opposite. 
namely we have to drop the bare Hamiltonian, bare green function, and somehow deal with this one. Uh, I will show you today how to make this uh, vague idea precise. Mm, but um, and uh, as a matter of fact, that explains this possibility to drop all bare terms. Um, it's related to the universality, because what remembers about particular system is the, uh, its bare green functions. More generally, the tree as you know, the classical approximation is the tree approximation. And uh, all these vertices of the trees, uh, if they become negligible, then uh, nothing really depends on the initial Hamiltonian, uh, on the particular scheme of quantization, and so on. Uh, it's somehow becomes self-consistent. We'll, uh, it's very vague uh, at the moment, but we will, we will see. Uh, before, before we um, go into this general framework, uh, our goal will be to develop some general framework in which you can calculate uh, all those uh, things, the exact green functions. And we indeed will see that they are much greater. Uh, roughly speaking, I'll tell you, I'm uh, running slightly ahead of myself, but I'll tell you what one of the many important answers uh, which we will be getting will be the following. Uh, you see, if let's, uh, for simplicity, let's take mu equal to zero. Then the free green function is of the order of k square. Now, uh, in the Ising model, we can solve this, and I will discuss right now how to approach to the solution of the Ising model. And But right now I will tell you the answer. The answer is that uh, the green function, the exact green function, is actually 1 divided by k to the power 7 fourth. And you see that when k, so the inverse of it is k 7 fourth. That's the result of the exact solution. It takes quite, quite a few efforts to get it. Um, uh, and uh, these numbers, by the way, these critical exponents are just those uh, topological invariants, uh, so to say, uh, which we discussed uh, last time, in the sense that you vary a little bit the system. There are topological invariants in the space of all systems. When you vary the, system, the property of interaction a little bit, they don't change. Mm. And you see also that they are much for k much smaller than one, which means that we go to the limit. Uh, k is typically is one hour distance. So if you go to the distance much larger than the lattice space, that corresponds to k much smaller than one, and it's much greater than k square. And k square can simply be neglected in comparison, and that. Uh, uh, that one of many examples how this universality happens, why it takes place. The question, of course, is how to evaluate those uh, uh, these numbers are called critical exponents, and the question is how to, how to find them. So let's uh, go back for a short while to the Ising model. And I started to introduce last time uh, a very important concept for field theory, the concept of disorder parameter. Uh, and also some other things. Um, the disorder parameter, uh, the order parameter in the Isaac model is very simple, it's just this variable sigma x which is plus or minus 1. Mm. No. Uh, and we replaced it by the continuous field. 
according to Landau principle, since the symmetry is just reflection symmetry Z2, uh, we have to write to introduce some uh, coarse grain spin. You, the way you do it is actually unimportant, but uh, uh, you just say that you have ever you take some domains and uh, you take the average spins of these domains and you call it phi of x. The whole notion of phi of x makes sense if it changes, uh, if, it, if it is very slow, if at the lattice distance you can neglect its change. So, uh, uh, which means something, the criterion something like that. It makes sense if the gradient of phi divided by phi are much smaller than uh, 1 over a, where a is the lattice size, or the radius of interaction, if, if they are different. Um, and that explains why in, in the Landau case you always deal with a minimal number of derivatives. You keep minimal number of derivatives. Uh, so, uh, why do we need to introduce something more than that? Uh, the reason is, remember, the, the, when we, we, we went from sigma to rigorously without coarse graining, we replaced sigma by phi x, the field, and then it develops to phi of x. And the potential energy for this field was logarithm of cosh of phi. So it's a terribly nonlinear field theory with which we, and the equation of motion, we can write down the equation for the, um, uh, for the green functions. Uh, these equations uh, will be relating, will be very difficult to deal with. Uh, they will be relating to the two-point functions with the four-point functions with the six-point functions and so on. So it's not very encouraging uh, to take a dire direct attack. And we, so we, uh, generally speaking, if we have a theory, uh, not the Ising model but something else, one stops here because uh, it's not clear what to do next with this. However, uh, in the Ising case, there is a, the, there is a miracle, real miracle. Uh, you can find variables uh, in which the theory becomes free, um, which means that the two-point functions, uh, the equation for the two-point functions is concrete and it closes and the four point function is just uh, you just have the um, Gaussian relation between go ahead uh, so the scalar field um, you it's it important to consider its range of values like will it only take a value between minus and plus one uh, uh, good, good question uh, uh, very important uh, to to avoid con the confusion a small uh, mathematical achievements of, of the first lecture was that we managed to replace the unpleasantly bounded field by the field without a bound. So phi is normal, uh, takes values in from minus infinity to plus infinity. And that's, and by the way, as I said, uh, this step uh, is mathematically precise. There is no approximation here. This step is a little bit vague. Uh, it's uh, uh, coarse graining, which can be done in any way. The cutoff, again, it it's can be done in any way. So if you obtain some expression which depends on the cutoff, for example, for which high gradients are important, like the critical temperature, then it doesn't may it doesn't have any. A real sense. It it me it simply means that uh, this quantity depends on the details of the interaction. But um, 
uh, in this case it's different. So, um, as I said, uh, the hope and the goal is to find new variables in which uh, the correlation function uh, will be simply Gaussian. Uh, by that one means that the four-point function is expressed as the squares of the two-point function, six-point function also. That, in other words, you have the weak theorem. Um, uh, uh, Gaussian free fields are synonyms, uh, which means that we are dealing with uh, non-interacting particles. Now, that's impossible to do uh, if you use only normal expression for fields. You can try, of course, to change the field by some expression which depends on, on the original field. Uh, but this is, that doesn't help in any way. Um, you turns out you have to, to deal with, you have to exploit very heavily uh, the um, kramers vanier duality and construct, in kramers vanier duality, uh, the system, uh, in the Ising case, kramers vanier uh, is self-dual in the sense that it takes the original lattice, the original Ising model, to the same Ising model, but at different temperature. I remind you that uh, what we derived is that if you have, uh, we showed that uh, um, if you have an uh, Ising model at the temperature beta, at the inverse temperature beta, then uh, when you have tange beta, there is another temperature, beta twiddle, um, related like that. Um, and if one is below phase transition, the other is above. And uh, uh, the duality relates properties of the model at the temperature beta and at the temperature beta twiddle. Um, and it turns out that you have to use both uh, both systems to, to get an interesting variable. And it has the reason why I'm spending some time, not too much, uh, discussing this object, the disorder parameter, is that it has wider significance than, than just the Ising model. And it even may be useful in the attempts to solve three-dimensional Ising model, which so far failed. Um, Okay, uh, so the def first of all, the definition of the, dis of the order parameter, as I said, is very simple. It's just this variable, and you have to, the, if you want to calculate the correlation, say, expectation value of it, or expectation value of several ones, you simply say, uh, okay, we take e to the minus beta epsilon, this is the Boltzmann factor. We put sigma x here and we divide it by the partition function. That's the standard definition of statistical mechanics. Nothing uh, very interesting here. Uh, the way you define disorder parameter is quite unusual. First of all, you associate uh, the uh, disorder parameter with the dual lattice. The dual lattice is the lattice when, uh, um, uh, where uh, you, which are the, set at the, but the sides are at the center of the faces. Uh, and you put it somewhere here. By the way, uh, that's a side remark. Uh, we uh, worked always on the square lattice, but uh, you can use Kramer's Vanier duality uh, on the other lattices also. If you take, for example, triangular lattice, then what do you think would be the dual system? 
פה. אה? Then uh, it, it, it will be hexagons which we will be dealing with and after duality transformation. And there, there is also, uh, this I will not, I, I just mentioned this, that uh, there is also some uh, finite transformation called star triangle transformation, which allows to determine in this, even in this case, the critical temperature. I remind you that the critical temperature is determined when by the condition that beta tilde is equal to beta. That defines the critical temperature. Um, so returning to this thing, uh, we take an arbitrary contour connecting, uh, uh, connecting uh, the disorder parameter and the contour is supposed to go to infinity. Um, if you have two disorders, uh, you can actually have a finite contour. Let's have two disorders for, although I will be. Uh, you take an arbitrary contour connecting two disorder parameters. If you don't have it, then you have to go to infinity. There is some uh, subtlety with boundary conditions uh, which are classified. I, I, Again, I will not go into this, but they are classified by uh, homology groups, um, depending on what kind of surface, whether you are on a torus or on a, some higher genus surface. That's sometimes important in string theory, but uh, sh sh we shall disregard these subtleties now. Um, so, uh, and the prescription is the following. When, whenever uh, this line crosses the link, you change the coupling on the link. So each link, the link 1, 2, uh, actually gives you the, uh, the energy of the link is uh, minus, or minus sigma 1, sigma 2. That's the standard energy. The energy of this guy will be plus sigma 1, sigma 2. Uh, so to, uh, and um, you can say, uh, and it's actually useful, you can, uh, you can say that in order to get this correlation function, you have to insert e to the minus 2 beta sigma n sigma n plus 1 uh, along this contour c. Mm. When you introduce this factor, uh, then you, it, it is equivalent to saying that uh, you reverse all this coupling on each on each link. Uh, now the first interesting feature of, of, of this uh, definition is that it is in fact independent of uh, of of this contour. Uh, at least in this situation, when you have no, no order parameters, if you have only disorder parameters in the system, then uh, this correlation function, which apparently would depend not only on the positions of these guys, <coughs> but also on the, mm, on the shape of the contour, uh, is um, contra-independent, and the proof is very simple. Let's take a close, let's take a contribution of the close contour.
So now we want to calculate the partition function uh, in which um, we either, either insert this factor or simply say that we uh, change this coupling, we, we do this change with the coupling uh, minus sigma 1, sigma 2 becomes plus sigma 1, sigma 2. Uh, so we have sum over all, the partition function is sum over all sigma, and uh, we have e to the beta sum uh, sigma sigma prime, and um, let us uh, put the tilde here, which means that we avoid, uh, we, we don't sum over spins uh, related by these couplings, and we have Double tilde means that uh, with some over spins which are connected by this coupling. And the statement is that this is uh, precisely equal to the original partition function. Why is that? It seems uh, a, a bit difficult to... In fact, all, all is quite simple. Uh, As a matter of fact, it's more difficult to define all these uh, things than uh, to work with them. I'm summing over all possible sigmas here. So what can I do? What change of variables can I perform uh, which, which, which will reduce the modified partition function to uh, the original partition function. Change sigmas which are inside the control? Yes, exactly. If I simply change sigma inside to minus sigma inside, it is the sum doesn't change, uh, but uh, it is equivalent to having uh, to reversing the coupling here. Um, and uh, so uh, that the fact that the closed contour, uh, if you have two independent contours, then uh, they will give the same thing. So if we look at the if we uh, look at this definition, uh, we can very easily. Um, prove the following. We can prove that uh, um, if you have a correlation function uh, calculated at the temperature beta twiddle, it's the same as the correlation function sigma x1, sigma x2 calculated at the temperature beta. I suggest that you do it yourself um, using um, all these definitions, the fact that we insert this thing. In fact, it's almost trivial because you, all you have to do is to check uh, that uh, if you have mu at the point x and mu at the point x plus delta, uh, it is the same as uh, energy density, sigma, sigma. Uh, and so you can, uh, I'm, I'm giving you a hint, but you have to, it's insta it would be just easier for you to work it out yourself than to follow it on the blackboard. Um, the idea of the proof is that you relate bilinears of mu to bilinears of sigma and rewrite uh, the original partition function in, the, uh, in terms of mu. Anyway, um, this, uh, th 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 this uh, uh, fact that uh, it is counter independent. Yeah, go ahead. This, this x1 and x1 star depends on the half the lattice counts. Oh, no, 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 they are the same. It's, uh, 
look, if you have this thing and this thing, the distance between them is the same lattice. The, the lattice size is precisely the same. It becomes one half if you look, well, that's what I'm coming to when you have together. The key point, the reason it becomes very useful, you see, mu by themselves is, are no better than sigmas. Um, they also satisfy nonlinear equations, same nonlinear equations. But uh, when you combine sigma and mu together, as we will do now, uh, you get a wonderful object, fermion, and those fermions will be free. That's why uh, we are doing all this. <coughs> I'm sorry, I don't understand what the mu is. Is this the, whether or not there's a, dis, uh, wait, there's a path passing through that particular placket? Say it again? Uh, I don't understand what mu is. What determines Oh, okay. Path? What does... What good. Um, the definition is this. You calculate the partition function, uh, which uh, depends on the contour reconnecting points x1 and x2. The definition of this partition function is clear, yes? You just reverse those couplings. You divide it by the original partition function, and this is the definition of mu x1, mu of x2. Um, very strange. It's, it's always, you know, uh, when you have something fresh, some, something unusual. Uh, uh, you see, people used to define some changes of variables in, uh, in functional integral in terms of scalar fields, uh, change fields, change coordinates. All this is nice and useful, but here we have a completely novel concept of how to define correlation function. And that's kind of, and it turns out actually. Uh, it was developed in the 60s, but uh, very recently it turns out to be very, uh, very useful in uh, some uh, topological models and so on. People are getting a lot of results uh, from that. So this uh, ZCX1 school, is that for a given, a given contour or for all contours? Yes. Uh, a given contour what? Is that for all the contours? Oh, uh, no, 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 no. It's uh, exactly, you take a particular contour, okay? Uh, you reverse those couplings. Okay. It's clear, yes? yes. And, and, and then you calculate. Exactly, it's exactly what you wrote right, right there, right? Uh, with the sigma tilde and sigma tilde tilde. Uh, uh, partition function. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yeah, go ahead. So last time we defined like, uh, like a one-point function of mu. Yeah. You define two point. Is there a way to independently define it as a field, or is it we going to, are we going to do that now? Like. Uh, well, you know, uh, I defined it a one-point function. You, you can define actually arbitrary endpoint end function yeah. in this way, and that that defines the correlation, the the function of x one, x two, x n. The only reason the one-point function I could perfectly. I, I, I can constrain myself with one point function. There is a slight uh, unpleasantness uh, related to the boundary conditions in case of one point function, which is a minor. And I just, uh, to avoid this, I, I now look at the two point function. But if one point function is more appealing to you, you are, it's perfectly fine to work with one point function. No, no, no. I mean, just. Can we visualize it as a field taking uh, values in any, like, I don't know, in real numbers? I, I don't think... Uh, uh, well, yes. Uh, you can uh, calculate uh, the mu. It's certainly a field taking number of, uh, taking value in real numbers. Uh, in principle, you define all correlation functions of this field. And these correlation functions, due to this duality relation, will be... Uh, completely the, uh, exactly the same as uh, this correlation function of the originalizing model. So, although we define it indirectly, int we define 
the theory is defined by, by its correlation function. When the correlation functions are defined, you know everything. And you can realize, your question was probably that whether you can realize it by some functional integral or something like that. No, that's clear. If we know all the correlation functions, we can write the uh, generating uh, functional yeah. function. Yeah, we can, you can say that. Uh, the key point in this definition was that uh, uh, that we introduced an arbitrary contour, and it turns out, uh, at least up to now, that um, things depend only on the ends of this contour. They don't depend on the contour itself. Uh, but that's not quite always the case. Uh, so, uh, to 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 complete it, to finish this this line, there's. Uh, Although we define it indirectly, it's the same. The, the in terms of the formula, the value of these correlation functions they are the same as the correlation functions of the ordinary, of the order parameter. Uh, so it seems when you consider them separately, they are equivalent. Yes, please. Uh, so how do you define uh, higher? Uh, for okay, uh, good point. Uh, it's quite simple, actually. Uh, take four point uh, ought uh, function. Let's take a four point function. You have a lot of freedom in doing this. You can, for example, take this thing and this thing. Uh, or you can uh, interchange these contours. Uh, these contours, I'm uh, again uh, getting slightly ahead of myself. They are, they have two analogies. Um, mathematically, on a when you have a branch point on the Riemann surface, um, you can uh, deal with it by uh, using a cut. Uh, for example, when you have some function square root of c minus a z minus b you you need to cut the complex plane uh, and the the form of the cut you can choose arbitrarily um, we will see that it's very close the connect, connect it's only the topology of the cut and endpoints which matter it doesn't matter whether you define square root of z, for example, by the cutting the plane like that, or taking this kind of a cut. And uh, it, it defines the same Riemann surface. When you have two sheets uh, glued <coughs> through the cut, it's topologically the same thing. Um, that's one analogy which to be kept in mind. And it will become we will make it precise very soon. Uh, maybe we have uh, the link between these two lines. Or not? Yes. Oh, the link. Yeah. I mean, like uh, the, the lines that connect these two contours. Like we have two uh, two, uh, two lines. Like yes. We have uh, point, point one, uh, two, three, four, and one line connects like uh, one, uh, one, two, and uh, second connects three, four. Yes. And uh, and can you uh, add uh, one more line that uh, goes from? Uh, no, no. I, I think you need uh, the, the this uh, line should end at the disorder parameter. So all you can all you can do you can interchange them. You can connect, for example, one with four. Yeah, just because every every point has infinite line, and then when we have two points, two infinite lines just cancel each other. You are co absolutely correct, and that was precisely the reason why I, uh, started with one point function. That they I didn't want to talk about topology of the whole thing. Um, in one point function, you force this line to infinity, but this infinity can. Of course, when two lines, uh, uh, if you have two lines uh, which go, which are one over the other, they cancel each other. The, because you, the, it means that you change twice uh, the sign of the coupling. Um, mm. Does this mean that any odd 
point correlation function is zero? Uh, well, uh, not quite. Um, you see, they are zero. It's a very good question. Uh, it's uh, if you. It depends on the temperature. If you are in, if beta uh, is smaller than beta critical, you are in paramagnetic phase. So you have sigma x zero in this case. There is no magnetization, but mu x is non-zero, and vice versa. As you go, to, so you have disorder parameter non-zero. Non if you go, if you have beta low temperature region, in this case uh, we, we are in ordered phase. So disorder parameter is zero. That's the reason for the name of this, by the way. Uh, disorder parameter is zero, but uh, uh, but sigma x is not zero. So it's uh, they are exactly symmetric with respect to each other, sigma and mu. Uh, the, mm, so that's um, mm, but uh, wait to see uh, what happens when we have two things. B by the way, one more uh, analogy. So one analogy which will we will make precise. There are like cuts or like uh, cuts in the complex plane. Um, the other physical analogy, uh, uh, those of you who know about Dirac monopole, uh, uh, remember that uh, Dirac monopole is defined is a, in the case of uh, Maxwell theory, you can define a monopole in the following way. Mm. You have, uh, you see the problem is that the divergence of magnetic field should be zero. Uh, but if you have a, a monopole, it seems to acquire a delta function. So one adds an infinite solenoid to the monopole so that the magnetic flux uh, goes out through this solenoid. Now, when the, what uh, we will be talking in more details later in the course about it, but what Dirac noticed uh, is very beautiful that if you have, um, mm, if, if you have, uh, if you quantize magnetic flux and you try to scatter any charged uh, charged field, charged particle on this uh, solenoid, the result will be zero. So this solenoid will be invisible. Um, it's a simple consequence of the quantization condition. So the Dirac, and it's called the Dirac thread or Dirac filament, uh, and uh, it is three-dimensional analog of uh, of this contour connecting uh, those two things. Um, there, are, there are other, uh, well, we will, I will give you more example when we will be later in the course of such, such objects. They are not always the contours, there are sometimes uh, surfaces and, uh, uh, of different dimensions. Mm. Uh, okay. Mm. So now let, let's do things. Uh, as I said, it's completely all other uh, points are irrelevant to me. Uh, but let's look at the following situation. Um, or maybe I shall use this thing, use this picture. Uh, so we define things like that. Um, and let's suppose that we also have uh, an order parameter put somewhere here. So, uh, if we have no disorders, we can actually look at the uh, closed contour.
And I just argued, uh, we, we discussed it a few minutes ago, that that doesn't change the partition function. So according to our definition of new partition function to old partition function, nothing depends on the shape of this, or nothing depends on this, uh, on, on this contour. But now imagine that uh, we have uh, we, we, we have a order parameter here. Uh, think what will be the difference. Before we said um, because uh, any closed contour doesn't contribute to the partition function, uh, nothing depends on the on the contour here. Because if we take another another contour, it will be just the contribution of the closed contour. Um, but now I put somewhere, I put, I put a disorder parameter. So I want, in other words, I want to consider the correlation function sigma of x1, mu of x2. Star means that it's on the dual lattice. Um, so now I want to consider this thing. Um, and I define it again uh, as a sigma is sigma. It's straightforward. And mu is uh, our old definition with the, um, uh, with the uh, uh, dislocation, so to say, with a uh, coupling uh, changed if crossed by this line. So what do you think, how it will be, so it, generally speaking, it can depend on, on the contour. So we have Z, which depends on the X1, and the contour P X2. If you want to, you can add more mu to, but uh, let's, let's assume that the contour goes to Divided, that the contour goes to minus infinity, and uh, that's it. Or to, it ends at some other disorder parameter, that's irrelevant. The relevant thing is what can you say about uh, dependence, on, uh, dependence on the path here. When the, for that, we have to decide what would be the contribution of this picture. And if you remember the logic by which we obtained uh, obtained uh, contour independence before, you can easily ask. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't understand your definition. Okay, let me make it more clear. Uh, the definition is simple; is straightforward. <coughs> But let me repeat the drawing. Uh, we have uh, sigma at the position x1. We have uh, mu at the position x2. This is x2 star. We take an arbitrary contra going to infinity. Um, we now calculate the sum over all spins. We have sigma of x1 here. You have e to the minus beta epsilon. And now we again have the sum of sigma sigma with a twiddle, with a plus, and And that's what we define as sigma of x1, mu of x2. Now the definition that twiddle means that we exclude from summation all links uh, connecting these two points. Uh, double twiddle means uh, that we sum only on these pairs of spins. Um, so it is pretty straightforward. Uh, 
Are, are the signs reversed in the exponent? Uh, if, if twiddle a twiddle means that we are summing our spins which are far away, far from this defect. And why is there a plus in the exponent? Oh, but uh, 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 there was, the it's the original partition function was e to the beta sigma sigma. That was the original beta function without anything. Because you, you are asking, it's, it's the Gibbs formula, but epsilon is minus some sigma, oh, sigma. and uh, why it is minus? Because uh, I want the ground state to be a ferromagnet. I have to minimize the energy. Um, now I'm glad you are asking all these uh, minute questions because uh, you see to get the feeling of this, you you need uh, you you need to clarify all these small things. It's it's not difficult in principle. It's not something which is very, some hard combinatorics or something like that. Everything is simple, but slightly unusual. So it makes sense to um, really uh, try to uh, think over all these small details. Okay. Um, mm, but now something interesting is happening. Uh, something interesting is happening, and I was asking you uh, uh, what would be the contribution of the closed contour if we have uh, order parameter inside. Uh, if we don't have order parameter inside, we, we get one. So we, have, we calculate the partition function that uh, twiddle here. Uh, and we divide it by that. And uh, we just discussed few, uh, some time ago that uh, without this guy, you simply reverse all spins inside and you get the original partition function. So the contribution of, of the closed contour is equal to one. So uh, what do you mean that no. this is zero? No, think better. Minus one. It's minus one. It's minus one because now, mm, uh, see what's happening. Will you concede from the degrees uh, we change uh, sigma to, uh, to minus sigma? Ah, yes, sigma. yes, we just change sigma to minus sigma. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so it is minus one. And um, therefore, something interesting is happening. If you take now uh, the picture, uh, let's take the picture. Um, the answer for sigma mu depends uh, whether it comes with, uh, uh, from the right or from the left side. Uh, yeah, side yeah, and moreover, I shall, uh, you're, you are quite right, but I'll put it in a slightly more invariant uh, way. Uh, so let's suppose that we have um, uh, this guy here. And um, we want to make a full rotation, uh, 2 pi rotation. Namely, we will take the disorder parameter and go around this guy and then return to the same position. So, in other words, I'm taking, uh, taking x2 and I rotate x2 around let's take x1 to be 0, and then let's rotate x2 by 2 pi. Uh, what will happen to the correlation function? So my question is, uh, we have the correlation function sigma of 0, mu of x star, and I'm asking what will happen if I shall rotate x star by 2 pi around 0, so it returns to the same position as before. It will get minus. It will get minus. Uh, so, uh, oh, what it is, so what, uh, what, 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 what should come in mind? What kind of function it should be? Uh, 
uh, suppose we will, and we will calculate uh, the correlation functions sigma zero. Suppose we go to large, to the uh, sep large separation, and we have some continuous function uh, of star. Well, I'm, I'm writing the same formula, uh, but uh, okay. So, what kind of function in the whole plane? Suppose we complexify these coordinates, x. What, what can you say um, about this function? Can you uh, give me an example of the function which becomes properly in this sense? And properly here means that when we rotate it, we have uh, we have precisely the the loop, the the tail winds around the disorder. When the tail winds around the disorder parameter, we get minus one. Uh, huh? Yes, uh, it, should, it, should, it should behave precisely as uh, the analytic function with a cut. Um, and we can take the cut in any way we like. And this function square root of z if, if we ha it has certain particular value here, but if you go around uh, rotated by 2 pi, then it changes sign. So if z goes to the same position, but, uh, but uh, first you rotate it by 2 pi, the square root of z changes sign. Actually, I can, and uh, that's precisely what happens here. So that's the mathematical analogy. By the way, uh, a, a, a brief, a, a, a small side remark about mathematical analogy. Uh, I find it very convenient to think of multivalued functions on Riemann surfaces in the following way. Um, you can say you have um, a branch point somewhere for example, uh, we have the function of logarithm of z, which has a branch point here. What does that mean? That means that uh, you can take a, uh, you you can actually understand the value the value of this function at some arbitrary point depends not only on the position of this point, but it depends on the, ta on the same tail. Um, I shall make it precise. So, uh, because uh, you know that if you take some particular value here, and then you make a rotation and return back, then you, you will acquire 2 pi i in the logarithm. And you can see it in this, in, in this way. Let's write down the logarithm as integral to z, dz over z, say from 1 to the value of z. Uh, we have the point 1 and the value of z. And uh, when we take, and we have a contour like that, and we have a singularity here, at z equals zero, but the contour can avoid singularity completely. And now you uh, rotate, uh, rotate it around this thing, and you get the contour of integration uh, will be the following. Um, and um, you, uh, is it so? Uh, it, should, it should close, yes, yes, yes. It will actually be, um, let's, let's do it. Um, if we, no, it's okay, it's, uh, it's this one. And the difference between them is is just as this case is just the difference between these two contours is equal to the contribution which you get by rotating around this thing. So it's just the residue at the point uh, at, this, at, at the point 
at this point at z equals zero. So when you, in other words, uh, the right, what I was trying to convey is that it is sometimes convenient to think about the multivalued function like logarithm by saying that it depends not only on the position but also on the tail. So attach the tails to them and then the wind the tails. Uh, instead of the cuts, you can use also the cuts and Riemann surfaces, but sometimes it's more convenient to think about it this way. And you can even uh, study homotopy groups uh, related to this contrast and so on. Anyway, I, I'm just saying this not to teach you complex analysis, but just to stress the similarity between this statistical system and, uh, um, and, and the Riemann surfaces. Um, okay, um, how are we doing this time? Um, all right. uh, so, uh, this is mathematical analogy. But now uh, we get the correlation function, which has this strange property under rotation that it is multivalued under rotation. What should come in mind uh, in what, what's physical object uh, we, which has the same property? It's a fermion. And we will see now that indeed, what, what we will see in a moment is that uh, we simply get um, Dirac equation for those objects. We can out of nowhere, this system contains fermions, mm. uh, which is quite surprising. So let me uh, define them uh, precisely. Um, and these fermions, uh, the, the beauty of the fermions is that they satisfy non-interacting equations. The definition of the fermion on this lattice uh, is this. Uh, you take the, the order parameter and there are four different directions um, uh, looking in into the dual lattice. Uh, let's call these vectors Ea. A goes from 1 to 4. Mm, and we define the fermion psi of x, psi A of x. It will contain the index A from 1 to 4, as simply sigma of x, mu of x plus Ea. Uh, and it is now very simple to derive the equation. Now, uh, excuse me, from what we just said, uh, if we take Mm. The, the, fermion, the fermions are defined modulus sign. So if we, oh, what is it? Uh, us. Okay. Uh, and we, we, we can uh, uh, actually attach a tail. Suppose we start from this position and we attach this, the tail from Much better now. Uh, oh well. <laughs> uh, and defined in, uh, we, we can attach the tails and define it in a standard way. Uh, but when we rotate around 2 pi, uh, the sign changes and we will see that. Psi A of X is actually, if you go from 1, 2, 3, 4, 
it's 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 equal to minus psi a plus four. Um, well, we have this we will have this restriction, but what is uh, quite simple and interesting is that we can derive uh, from the definition uh, the tail as I as I said is the factor that. And we can write it down as a product of the terms sinh, uh, cosh 2 beta plus sinh 2 beta sigma sigma prime. Um, and if you insert it in this uh, equation, you will obtain the following the following equation for the fermions. Um, notice it's basically the same way we derived equations for sigma, the mean field equations, but this time it will it will be linear. Um, the equation will be that psi a of x will be equal to uh, uh, Sinch uh, cosh two beta. Uh, uh, if I sum it over psi a plus one at x minus sinch two beta psi a plus two at x plus delta a. Excellent. A plus two delta A. Um, in any case, that's uh, you will better follow. That is a, de a, a derivation uh, which you can easily do yourself by by looking at this picture or read in my book. Um, uh, it's uh, not a big deal. What's important is that what happens in the continuous limit. And to explain what happens, I have to digress a little bit to, to tell you about uh, the symmetries, uh, which, symmetries of similar equations. Um, so let's uh, have a, the following, let's have the following discussion. Yes. What is it, uh, Excuse me, yes. It's, you have also vectors nearest neighbors, say delta 1, delta 2, delta 3, and delta 4. You, you have uh, psi's are defined, although in fact psi's are symmetric, it should be defined some, it's slightly non-invariant definition because I attached psi's to the original lattice, but they are equally well can be attached to the dual lattice. But uh, if we stick to the original lattice, we will get, we have this uh, four vectors E and four vectors delta. And uh, as you, where, where, where the equation comes from, you simply uh, notice that you have, um, it's, may, I'm not sure I should be explaining this because it's easier to, to, to do it yourself. Uh, than to follow, uh, there are such things. Uh, so what uh, is happening, you have s spin operator here and you get the sigma sigma prime uh, term, s sigma sigma prime term from, uh, from this link. And it erases sigma, creates mu, and so mm, uh, you get the equation uh, with the equation like that, but it's um, it's it, it really will be better if you if you try yourself to insert into this uh, in, into this expression this uh, this factor. Uh, what interests me now is not so much the derivation, which is straightforward, but the result. Um, and to understand the result. Um, Mm. To understand the result, uh, 
let me say a few general words. Uh, when we have a field file x, what do we call um, elementary particle in general? We, we say that this field describes, uh, describes elementary particles, uh, but what does that mean? Uh, what it means is that, first of all, uh, the, this field is, uh, gives us a representation of the Poincaré group. Um, the Poincaré group is the transformation in this Euclidean version. It's the it's rotation, so you have x prime i, lambda i k, x k, plus a i. Um, and we say that under this transformation, if the field, if if this is a scalar field. We have this this expression. Now, uh, this is definitely a representation. By definition of representation, uh, we certainly know uh, that, uh, that if we take a product of two transformations, it will be uh, the product of two transformations here, and so on. Uh, so it's it's we certainly get. The I remind you, the representation for some group uh, is if you have element of the group and uh, the multiplication should, the, the most important feature of, of the operation called representation, operator called representation is this one. Um, now, there are uh, the question is whether it's, uh, let's concentrate, for example, on rotations. Uh, is it reducible representation or irreducible? I remind you, irreducible representation means that uh, you cannot make it smaller. Uh, and uh, you cannot find the combination of, if you have uh, the, basis of representation. Uh, there's no way you can uh, have linear combination which will be invariant under this uh, upper, under all operations. So, uh, uh, and I remind you also to get the answer to this uh, is, uh, for example, let me give you an example. We have a vector vi, and we have a tensor, say, hij, under, and they transform under rotations, like you have orthogonal matrix. Now, is this irreducible representation, the vector of rotation group? Huh? I don't know. It's, it's irreducible. It is irreducible because when you have a three dimensional vector, you cannot uh, find a combination of components of this vector which would not transform. However, is this a reducible representation? And why not? It's, so it transforms like that. So this is. Irreducible. This is a uh, reducible. Why I'm saying it's reducible? It's symmetric. Uh, yes. That is uh, first of all. If it uh, well, uh, let's take symmetric tensors. Uh, suppose we're dealing with symmetric tensors. Is it reducible or not? The trace. Yes, the, the, trace. the trace. The trace is what makes it uh, reducible. But if you subtract the trace, then finally you will get irreducible representation. Okay, now let's go to the slightly more complicated question. We have a field um, in space, and we have the we define the action of rotation on this field as simply a simple rotation of coordinate. 
it's a scalar field. Uh, the question is, is it reducible or not? The fact that it is a representation is obvious. Uh, but the fact that uh, the, the, the thing which we have to decide uh, is whether I can make some operations uh, which will commute with rotations and uh, which I, we, 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 whether I can find some invariant combination of phi's uh, which uh, I can put to zero to make representation uh, irreducible. Like here, I found the trace. Here it's, it's uh, actually infinite dimensional representation because phi of x uh, has infinitely many values. Um, and it's of course reducible, but how can I make it irreducible? For that, uh, we need to, to uh, know operators uh, which act on phi and which is which are uh, invariant under rotation uh, and you know very well at least one such operator which can act on phi huh? well Laplace operator uh, so you can always impose the condition that the Laplace operator, Klein-Gordon operator, is zero. It doesn't break rotational asymmetry, but it eliminates a lot of things making uh, this uh, irreducible representation. In this, in this sense, uh, one uh, possibility is to say that uh, uh, element particles are just irreducible representation of the rotation group uh, and you see how it comes out well with only we will continue next time because uh, here we will encounter also with irreducible representation but of the different kind with multi-valued uh, irreducible representation let's stop here <laughs>